Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. Today, I am here with a very special guest. We have Jeffrey Notkin. He is very influential in uh, very many uh, realms of, uh, you know, the book industry, the film industry, uh, even the comic book industry. So, uh, Jeffrey, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, thank you, James, for that, that very kind intro. I am a television host, a, an indie film producer, an author, publisher. I am active in the science world. I'm a meteorite specialist. I'm also a spaceflight advocate. I'm president of the National Space Society, which is a global nonprofit dedicated to, to establishing a permanent human presence in space. And I, despite my funny accent, I, I am actually an American. I, I was born in the East Village in New York City. But my parents were both foreign service and they moved to the UK when I was, an, well, I was an infant. So I grew up in the UK, a very English boy with very eccentric American parents. And then it, later in life, I moved to the States on my own. And I went to art school, to School of Visual Arts in New York City. And in 2004, I moved to Tucson. So I've been here ever since. And it was because of the Gem Show. But, well, that's not entirely true. So I, the first time I came to Arizona, I was 10 years old on an adventure holiday with my parents from London. And, and let me tell you, a 10 year old kid going from gray, rainy old London out here to Arizona, it just utterly blew my mind. And I'd, I'd, I'd never met a Mexican person. I'd never met a Native American. I didn't even have Mexican food. We didn't have Mexican restaurants in England in the early seventies. And seeing cactus and reptiles in the wild eagles we went to the grand canyon the petrified forest so i was totally smitten with arizona as a kid and i i always had this dream that i would one day perhaps live here and then in later life when i became completely infatuated with george harriman's crazy cat cartoon which is which is set in coconino county that was another impetus my my favorite comic strip of all time and then in the 90s because of my work in meteorites and paleontology I started attending the gem show and so I got to come back to Arizona in I was living in New York then New York City and so to to come to Tucson in February you know what New York's like in February and you know what Tucson's like in February so you leave this horrible frozen <laughs> vista of these buildings with icicles hanging off them and everybody in a bad mood because they're slipping and falling on black ice on the pavement and you come out here to Tucson and it's sunny and mild and there's amazing food and music and after a few years of that, I, I said, oh, I'm, I'm just going to move to Tucson. I just want that. I want that all the time. So so I, I moved to Tucson voluntarily uh, out of love. And it, I've traveled all over the world and I've, I've lived in many different places. And, and Tucson stole my heart is, is my home. Absolutely. It seems and to I, do that I, to a lot of people. <laughs> I'm sorry? It say, seems to do again. that to a lot of people. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, I've met so many people here from other parts of the world and there are quite a few Brits here I, I I meet quite a few expat Brits and Scots and uh, I, I I'm asked quite quite frequently what is it about you Brits in the desert why why do you have such an affection for the desert and the only thing that I can come up with is when I was a kid they often used to show Lawrence of Arabia during the during the Christmas holidays <laughs> in the pre in the pre-video and streaming era when you couldn't just watch any movie that you want any time and so I think we all have this image of Peter O'Toole walking over, hiking over the giant sand dunes, burned into our consciousness. And we want that. We want to get away from the rain, <laughs> and the gray, and see the desert. And uh, I, I did, but wholeheartedly. That's so wonderful. All right. So uh, you, of course, have a lot of knowledge within the graphic novel and uh, comic book industry. Uh, so, you know, based off of uh, from what I've heard from friends and family who are, you know, very much into that uh, universe, it is a very impactful uh, form of media, uh, especially with relationship building and self-expression and learning, uh, particularly about, you know, people and about yourself. Uh, in what ways have uh, you seen comic uh, you know, impact their consumers over the years? Let me start by, by saying how they impacted me. Mm -hmm. I so transfixed by comics as a child. 
And I think part of it was the rarity of, I loved American comics. There, there was a British comics industry when I was a kid, but they were largely black and white comic books. And a lot of them were, were sports based or, or slapstick humor based. We, we did have a, a few really, a few really great things like Frank Hampson's stand there, but American comics were, were this treasure, this extraordinary artifact, artifacts that were filled with these beautiful images and stories. And that's the, really the key to me is that it's the combination of the two mediums. So if you're reading a book, you're reading a book and the images are in your mind. And if you're looking at art, you're looking at art and you are experiencing the creation, you're looking, uh, hopefully moved by the work of the creator. And I'm stating the obvious, but comics are, are clearly both <laughs> put together. So we have, we have the image and we have the story. And one of the most brilliant observations ever made about comics in my lifetime was by Art Spiegelman, who I, I was fortunate enough to study with him, under him at School of Visual Arts. And then I went on to work with him, for him and his wife, Francoise Mouly Spiegelman at Raw Books and Graphics for several years and was Art's assistant during the, the Mouse, the era when Mouse was, was being published. So Art said, when you have a sophisticated comic, the the text, the word balloons or the description is in addition to the image. Mm -hmm. And then what he meant by that was he'd give an example of, say you have a, you have a, uh, a superhero comic and, and say, say Spider-Man is running down the street and he's chasing the Green Goblin. And in his thought balloon, he's saying, I'm running down the street and I'm gonna catch the Green Goblin. You're, you're wasting, you're wasting a, a dimension of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And this, this was like a, a, a huge, uh, art light going off in my head when, when Art said this. So the text should elaborate upon the image. Mm. And if you like existential stuff, which I do, sometimes the text is very removed from the image. And you may you look at the image and then you read the text and you go, what? wait a second, let me think about this. And that's what you want, isn't it? You want the, the reader to stop and think for a second and go, wait, this is this is really interesting. This is this is grabbing my imagination. So, so to go back to your question, I, I comics introduced me to a larger world. They expanded my imagination and my my concept of what could be to to an enormous degree. And I I love science fiction books and I love television and film. And I I've, I've been active in in both worlds, in the sci-fi world and in the film and TV world. But somehow comics put that together. And I, when I was 10 years old, I started attending a very strict, ultra strict all boys school in England, in South London. It was really was like something out of a Dickens novel. So we're studying Latin, we had to wear uniforms and the, the teachers would go around some of them with canes, with bamboo canes and they hit the kid if your math or maths as we called it in England, your, your, or sums, your mathematical sums were incorrect or your, your Latin was, you had a grammatical error. They might just hit your desk or hit you on the back. It was very, it was brutal. It was a brutal, savage experience. And I met this kid there when I was 10, this other, this other boy, this strange, eccentric, brilliant boy who was also very deeply moved by comics. Mm -hmm. And we became friends forever. And that boy was Neil Gaiman. And that's how my Forrest Gump journey through the world of comics, where through absolutely no talent or skill of my own, I met and worked with some of the most brilliant people who ever lived in the comics world. And I just was so lucky. I just, I fell in one thing after another. And how could you get a better start than growing up with Neil Gaiman? <laughs> So we, we would sit at the back of class and he, he, was, he was, even then as a kid, he was a writer. So he'd write and I'd illustrate his comics. So I was Neil's first artist by accident. And we got in so much trouble. I mean, I, you think of all the amazing people that worked with him, like Dave McKean and so many, so, so many brilliant artists, Charles Vess. And I, I think, gosh, I'm, 
I was so, I'm so useless compared to them. But but we were we were only kids, and we got in so much trouble. We would we get caught. We used to do this this sword and sorcery series because we were big Conan, big Robert E. Howard fans. Mm-hmm. Neil turned me on to Robert E. And Neil turned me on to so much stuff when we were kids. Robert Heinlein, Robert E. Howard, uh, eerie and creepy comics, Harvey Kurtzman. So he would write these 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 epic sword and sorcery tales and I'd illustrate them. And the villain in our in our strip was our French teacher named Mr. Harlow. And we, I turned him into this horrific monster with kind of Jack Kirby style with the big square teeth and the claws. And we actually got caught doing this in class and it was confiscated. I mean, imagine the level of embarrassment when your teacher goes, it's bad enough to get busted in class. Are you two what a droid doodling at the back? And so he took it and he looked at it and he realized that, that it was us. And so we were sent out or sent to the headmaster. We were, we're always in trouble. But I, I, t- I, sorry, it's an extremely long answer to, to your question. But the point is, I saw in Neil the same thing that had happened to me. And that's why we connected immediately. We had this shared love of, of comics and science fiction. And in a school of nearly a thousand boys, it was only the two of us and our friend Dave Dixon, who was also a comics fan. There, we didn't, there weren't any other boys interested in comics and science fiction. It, it isn't like it is now. It wasn't, sorry, it wasn't like it is now. Comics were really a fringe thing then, and that combined with the the unavailability of American comics made it really an eccentric niche, the tiniest niche of niches. Mm-hmm. And and so I I have seen that, I've seen it in our lives. Comics powered our lives. And we I have this this memory burned into my consciousness of of this very uh, severe teacher with his black robe and the flat black cap and he's yelling at us and he's going game and knocking you two are useless you two will never amount to anything and i i tell this i tell this to me almost every time i see him and he doesn't he's such a kind person he doesn't remember school life being as brutal uh, as i do and we've had conversations about this. And he goes, well, it wasn't really that bad. And I go, you just don't remember. And I said, you were always in another world. You were walking around reading Stranger in a Strange Land, aged 11. You were <laughs> able to detach yourself from, from this because he was so into books. And mm-hmm. I think part of my love of books comes from him also. And he would constantly be walking around with a massive book and and he'd hand it to me. He'd read a book every day or every couple of days. And he'd go, here, Jack, you've got to read read Heinlein. Heinlein, you've got to read Philip Dick. You've got to read this. And he was constantly giving me things. And so the, I owe him a huge debt for, uh, I was already in that world, but I was really just reading comics and a bit of golden age sci-fi like A.E. Van Vogt and Clifford Simak. And, and Neil turned me on to this uh, edgier, edgier stuff like Robert Sheckley and, and Kurt Vonnegut and, authors I'd even heard of when I was a kid. I'm not sure we should have been reading Kurt Vonnegut and Philip Dick when we were 11, but we but we were and that probably explains a lot. So in the in the in the in the an, an answer full of digressions. I I hope I got to the to the to the root of your question, but it is this it is this combination of stimulating the the visual part of our brain at, while satisfying the storytelling part of your brain and also those silver age marvel comics when we were able to get them like fantastic four and thor the jack kirby years uh, it, it's just mind-blowing to a kid and we were i think the richness of the experience was perhaps a bit maybe more for us at that time because there was so much less mm. media mm. we didn't have this was years maybe 10 years before vhs cassettes arrived there were three television stations in the UK. So we didn't have TV, we didn't have internet, we didn't have games. Although I had, did have a vintage pinball machine. That, that was one of our things. I had a 1960s pinball machine in my, in my house in Neil and, and our other, my other friends would come over, we'd have competitions. And we, we, did, we had this scorecard on the pinball machine that was absolutely done in a Jack Kirby style with huh. the, the metallic shiny thing with everybody's top scores. So I think that, that when, we, when we got comics, when comics came into our lives, they were, 
it was easier for them to become one of the main things in our lives because there were fewer distractions. And oh my gosh, they were such a welcome relief from the severity of school. Absolutely. Do you have uh, the old, old copies of your original pieces with uh, Gaiman still somewhere? Some. We, we, <laughs> so when we were 15, Neil said to me, we should start a band. We should start okay. a rock band. He said it would be a good way to meet girls. And so in addition to introducing me to Robert E. Howard and all this other great stuff, Neil introduced me to rock and roll. He took me to my first concert, which was Lou Reed when we were 15 years old. And then he said, okay, we're, we're gonna start this band. And we didn't really play any instruments. And he said, we were always roughhousing because he was a DC fan and I was a Marvel fan. <laughs> and we're always, you know, you know how kids argue about just stupid things. So he goes, oh, DC is much better. We have Commandy and Justice League, and I go, no, no, Marvel's much better. We've got Thor and Captain America, and so we'd roughhouse, and we, and he, he, so he said, he goes, Jeff, you're really good at hitting things like me over these DC versus Marvel arguments, and so y you should be the drummer. Hmm. So I got a drum kit and I taught myself drums, and he was the singer, of course, and he was really into Bowie and Lou Reed and all this alternative stuff. So there, there is a reason for me telling you this. So the, our our first band was called Chaos. And it was before, it was 1976, it was just before punk rock started. And we were doing this proto-punk glam thing, New York Dolls, Lou Reed, that kind of thing, Iggy Pop, David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust era. Huh. And so, of course, Neil was just the shoe in for that because he, he was uh, had a very commanding, uh, lively I mean, eccentric is not quite the right word but flamboyant he was very flamboyant mm -hmm. and charismatic even even as a kid and and so we started this band and we decided that we would we wanted to take out an ad in the school literary magazine which was called unicorn okay and I did the ad with, so the band members, we went to one of those black and white fo photo booth things and we took the four fo the photos and then I made this collage. It was very punk rock with torn paper and everything and, and put it in the school magazine. And the headmaster said, he banned the ad. He said, I'm not having, I'm not gonna mention the name of the school, but I'm, I'm, I don't wanna get sued, but I'm not having uh, this school's answer to the Sex Pistols take out an ad in our literary magazine. So at age 15, we're already getting banned from, from literature. But I ended up illustrating the cover for that magazine. And I believe, if I remember correctly, I think Neil had some poetry or a short story published in it. So I think that was the very first time either of us were published. And I have that. I have that original cover. And then that same year, we started this underground fanzine called Metro. Okay. We thought we were so clever calling it Metro because it was underground, man. And we, we reviewed films and, and concerts and it was all hand, it was all handwritten by our friend, Steve Gett, who went on to be a music business manager. He definitely had the smarts, but he was such an operator, Steve. He would call record companies and film distributors and go, hi, this is Steve Gett, editor of Metro Magazine. And we'd like to cover the upcoming Stranglers concert or whatever it would be. And we would get free tickets and and records and he was so brazen he called up Mick Ronson's we're all big Bowie fans so he called up Mick Ronson's manager and said oh yeah I'd like to interview Mick Ronson and so we went age 15 or 16 to interview the great Mick Ronson in our school uniforms and looking back on it it was so absurd and Mick was so charming at no time did he go god what are these kids doing here <laughs> so he was he spent the whole evening with us he invited us up to his hotel room we got to play his guitar it was amazing so you know mick ronson was in in david bowie in the spiders from mars those classic those classic uh, albums and then uh had a long career working with uh, guys from Mott the hoople and anyway and um, was a producer and i ran into him in later life when i was when i was in the in the rock rock and roll world mm -hmm. uh professionally I was working for, for a band called The Rich Kids, which was Glenn Matlock's band, Post Sex Pistols, and Mick Ronson produced their album. And so I met him 
backstage at a gig or at the manager's office or something and go, Mick, you probably wouldn't remember me, but years ago, I interviewed you at a hotel and turned up with my friend uh, in our school uniforms and you were so nice. And he bought us drinks. We were underage, but we had drinks with him. Anyway, the point of this is, so we did this magazine, Metro, for a couple of years, and I have all of those too. Uh, as for the comics of, uh, of Mr. Harlow, well, he tore them up in, in oh. front of us. And so that was my first encounter with censorship and the brutality of, uh, of, well, I would liken it to the way big tech is now. So the way big creators can silence little creators. And I am a great proponent of owning your own artwork and controlling your product. And that was, that's something I got from Joe Strummer, the front man for The Clash, I'm sure you know. So uh, absolute great hero of mine who, who would uh, total artistic control was his thing total artistic control and also some things were never intended for mainstream consumption i think is the wisest thing ever said by a human and i made a t-shirt of that i ordered a t-shirt some things were never intended for mainstream consumption and i think that sums up my life i i realized early on and this is really exemplified in the youtube generation that what you do is never going to appeal to everyone and you, you have to be true to yourself and I, I'm, I am quite a sensitive person, and we all, we all want to get likes on our videos. And I, I hate it when you see a thumbs down. I can have 500 thumbs up and one thumbs down on one of my videos, and I go, oh no, that person didn't like it. What do we do wrong? So I have to try. I have to. I, I try very diligently to move away from that. Mm -hmm. But I am a great, I'm a great believer in, in uh, creators' rights, and and I, I'm an archivist. I save. I save everything. I have so many things from the early school days, photos of us, and somewhere I have that, I still have that ad, which I think the, the, the school's answer to the Sex Pistols, which I think was done with rubber cement or tape, probably it's as non-archival as you could get. That, that's a, another lesson that I learned later. So yeah, I, I, have, I have some really wonderful things in, in the archive, including some, some cassette, cassette tapes of, of our early, our early <laughs> rock and roll attempts. So when I'm, I'm one of the executive producers of Dream Dangerously, which is the, the official Neil Gaiman documentary, which came out a couple of years ago, and is distributed by another great Tucson business, Brink Vision. Our friend David Pike released that, that film that was uh, directed by, by Jordan Renner. And the, I oh, completely lost my train of thought. Uh, oh yes, yes. So, so the the directors and producers of that film asked me if I would make available, if I would consider giving them some of the demos that we did in our teens. And I had made a solemn promise to Neil that I would never ever play them to anyone. And so I checked with him, and he said, "Oh, okay." I, I, he was very gracious. He said, I, "I guess it's okay." And then I couldn't find I couldn't find the tape after all that. So. So we ended up not using it, but I did some, uh, in, in addition to providing some other music for that film, I, I did a couple of original illustrations and I, I did a comic strip about our band mm -hmm. and the day Neil decided to retire from the rock industry at about age 16, mm -hmm. after getting hit in the head by a full can of beer that was thrown at one of our <laughs> gigs. Talk about thumbs down. I mean, that is a bit more extreme than get, getting a dislike on your YouTube video, getting hit in the head with a full can of beer. And I'm the one who put him into the ambulance. And after that, he goes, no, this rock and roll business is not for me. Very sensibly, very sensible decision. Wow. So uh, when you are on the conversation of comics with your friends or family, uh, what comics do you immediately recommend? I'm a big fan of, of some of the great classics. And I, I mentioned this briefly at the beginning, but I, I consider George Harriman's Crazy Cat to be not only my favorite comic strip, but one of the great achievements of the human race. <laughs> and for, so, so for people not familiar with it, it was, it was a daily strip and a Sunday strip that ran for decades the, in the first half of the 20th century. And Harriman was, an extraordinary innovator. Mm. So he played with not just the layout of the page, but 
the the interaction of characters and the the graphic identity of the page. And this this I I got all of this from from Art Spiegelman's amazing class, Language of the Comics, which I took it at School of Visual Arts. And and I have to say that School of Visual Arts on East Twenty Third Street in New York City, I cannot overstress how important that school was to me and, and my life and what a great school it was so i i attended there between 83 and 87 i did my i did my bachelor of fine arts really in three years i, I carried a really big credit load and had two part-time jobs but you had to do your portfolio class in in senior year so so i did three years and then then i went to work at raw books and graphics and and art and francois kindly allowed me to go to SVA one one day a week to do my portfolio class with Will Eisner, which we will talk about later. But art taught this class, language of the comics, from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. on Friday night, Friday evening. So I'm I'm carrying 23 credits, uh, working two part-time jobs, and there was we had a lot of homework at SVA. We had to create a lot of original material, and I just couldn't. And he only taught it every other semester. Mm -hmm. And I had one shot only to take it. And I, I really wrestled with myself and I thought, ah, should I, should I do this? Should I, should I? and I, I yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I can't not study with Art Spiegelman. And at that time he wasn't, it was, it was before Mouse was released as a book. It had been released as, as mini books in Raw Magazine. But Art, I think was largely remembered as, as, a, as an influential underground cartoonist from the 60s, mm -hmm. six, the 60s California movement. So he was very, highly respected in alternative comics and the underground but he wasn't the, the major major comic celebrity that he is now so i decided to take that class and i was so tired on friday evenings when it start at 6 p.m that i would i would take coffee sometimes two cups of coffee with me to class and art said i want a volunteer to run the projector the slide projector he put so much effort into this class he would bring boxes of slides and each class would in large part be devoted to a particular artist or comic strip or concept. So we had a class on, on Dick Tracy, we had a class on Windsor McKay and Little Nemo, and I volunteered to run the slide projector. So there I'm super tired, sitting in the dark on a, on a high stool, running the slide projector. And that's how I got to know art. And he really opened my eyes to the, the inner meaning of comics. It is to this day that was that was 1986, I think, the greatest class I I ever took. It he was such is such a brilliant teacher that it was it was profoundly moving, and he was the, always a great supporter of of I don't know if alternative comics is quite fair, but something other than just superhero comics, comics of substance. And talked about the bande dessinée in France and how comics in in Europe and Japan were taken more seriously than, than they are in the States. So it was a profound experience for me to, in my third year, quite close to getting my degree, and at, at that time fully the intention of being a career cartoonist, to have my mind open to this degree by by arts class. And I think it was I was aware of Herriman's Crazy Cat, but I didn't I didn't really see it for what it was until until i took that class with art and i really really want to recommend this book to uh, to anyone who is interested in comics this is the biography of crazy cat's creator george harriman and it's written by michael tisseron who lives in new orleans this is not only the best book about comics i've ever read it's one of the best books about anything i've ever read it's uh, an extraordinary piece of of scholarship and, and literary detective work and really very little comparatively was known about about Harriman's life he was kind of a Shakespeare character and so Michael Tisseron did enormous research and I mean look look at look at that size of that book that is a thick so <laughs> it, Harriman had an amazing life he, he ended up being very he was one of those people who was in the right place at great moments in history and the beginnings of the civil rights movement, the beginnings of the film industry in Hollywood. And like me, he fell in love with, with the Wild West mm. and spent a lot of time in the Four Corners area and Crazy Cat is set in Coconino County in, in Northern Arizona. So 
that's my, I mean, that's what I love I, the most is that strip. But, but there's so much great work out there. And something that interests me deeply is this idea that we live, we live in a digital world now. You can get almost any film that you want, any major film, new release, you watch it on your phone, you watch it on your laptop, you connect to your smart TV, whatever. And, and music, even, even CDs are now almost obsolete with streaming services. So I can go, oh, I want to listen to that, uh, that obscure track by my favorite reggae band, Black Slate from Jamaica. And I just log on and there it is. So it's instantly available. And, and we, can, we can duplicate stuff. It's so easy to make unlimited copies. So what happens to the original? What is the nature of the original in our digital world? And I've commissioned numerous artists to do work for me, beautiful illustrations. There is no original. I can't say, hey, can I have the original as well and frame it and put it on my wall? In, in many instances, that doesn't happen because the, the original is done in, in Illustrator or some other digital program and, and it only exists in the ether. <laughs> so the, so I, I am gonna answer your question and I, I want to I hold up these. So I bought these in Tucson at uh, And Gallery, Ampersand Gallery on, uh, on 4th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And these are handmade comics, mini comics, I, I call them. They're, they're not quite, they're not zines. I mean, they're, they're comics. Look at, look at the love that's, that's gone okay. into this. And this is, I particularly like this one. This is by my friend, Caleb Ballesteros, who's a local cartoonist and wonderful illustrator that I work with. So I walked into the gallery and I just, I just saw, I saw this and I go, oh, that's nice. Oh, it's Kayla's. And look, it comes with this, with this print. Huh. So this is what I recommend. This is what I love is are things that are handmade mm -hmm. that exist in small numbers, but also, and I'm not denigrating the online world, the online comics experience can be fantastic as well. And I'm, I'm very good friends with Lucas Turnbloom, the brilliant cartoonist who lives in San Diego, who, whose uh, graphic novel Dream Jumper has been optioned for film. And he's done a daily strip, imagine this, for, for many years. So the platforms to do a daily strip and share them with the world, it's really fascinating that you could, you could get that. So when I was a kid, we'd buy the newspaper. You go to the store, you buy the newspaper, and you read the daily strips. And now you can get your daily strip online in, in many cases for free. And so I, I recommend all of that. I think you should embrace everything that's out there. I'm not, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not saying this is the only way. This moves me because this was made by hand. Right. Somebody took the time, the artist took the time to, to fold this and staple it and take it to the shop and they probably make a dollar or two on it. To me, it exemplifies doing the work for the love of it rather than trying to get social media likes. That is a beautiful answer. I love that. And I mean, thank you. The, I'm sure, you, you know, the film industry has gone through so many changes just within the last 20 to 50 years. I'm sure the comic book industry has done the same, of course, with the digital age, along with all the, you know, evolutions that have happened before the digital age, too. So that, uh, most definitely. A, yeah, no, that, I'm sorry, that was a beautiful answer. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Well, and, and let me, I hope you don't mind me holding up some things. I just collected no, some things that I'm currently reading and things that I love. And this is a beautiful graphic novel that was written by Henry Barajas, who you may know, who's, who's something of a local hero. He lives in California now. He's uh, working for, with Dark Horse comics still, I believe. But, but I, I saw Henry at the Tucson comic book convention, which is is run by my friends, Mike and Teresita Olivares, who, I mean, talk about doing things for love, out of love. They've, they've built this from, from a, a small fan event, which I went to in the early days, to a major national event with tens Absolutely. of thousands of people at, at the convention center. So, so Henry worked on, on the Neil Gaiman documentary with mm. me and, and he wrote this graphic novel, Tata Rambo, about his grandfather and this is a true story and i love true stories in comics i love autobiographical things in the same way that i love memoirs in in, in traditional book form mm -hmm. 
So there is a wealth of material out there. And something that's facilitated this is lowered costs of printing. When, when I was in my 20s and studying and working with Will Eisner and doing his, his editing his student magazine, it was very expensive to publish something. And there were, there were, at School of Visual Arts, we had two comic book magazines, Will Eisner's Gallery and Harvey Kurtzman's Cartoons. And it was a fantastic experience because the school funded Will's SVA Gallery. It was called S Will Eisner's SVA Gallery of Cartooning Art. And so there was a budget for that. But Harvey's magazine, we students had to fund it ourselves. We had to find the money. We had to go out and sell advertising. So I edited both magazines. So I had this broad spectrum experience where here you've got a patron, this, which was wonderful that SBA did that. And, and Will was such a giant in comics that it was a really big deal that he was teaching there. It's actually why I went to School of Visual Arts specifically because huh. I, I found out that Will was teaching there. And so at my, at my girlfriend at the time was a student at SBA. This was in the, in the early eighties. And I'd had some very bad school experiences, as mentioned earlier. I'd been to several awful schools and one good one. And I vowed I'd never, my, uh, so, no, so knowledgeable in my early 20s, vowed I would never go to school again. And then my, my girlfriend invited me to go to her show at SBA. And I, I walked in there and I, I had this epiphany. I just walked in and I felt like this is my home. <laughs> and I... On, scrawled on the wall somewhere, spray painted on the wall in giant letters was, I am an American artist and I have no guilt, Patty Smith. And I go, this is so for me. And so I picked up the prospectus after the show and I'm on the subway, I was living, it's living in Manhattan. It's on the subway going home to the way upper west side. I lived in Washington Heights. Interestingly enough, I just discovered the other day that where I lived on Riverside Drive in Washington Heights, I was just steps away from where George Harriman lived in the early 1900s on the wow. same street. I mean, I can see the building in my head. I just found this out reading the, the new Tashin edition of the complete Crazy Cat Sunday strips, a beautiful oh. essay in that. So uh, I'm, I'm on the subway and I'm reading the school prospectus and I, I didn't know that this existed. There's a cartooning department at School of Visual Arts. You could actually go to school and get a degree in, in cartooning. And I could not, I could not, grasp this because in my earlier school experiences as i would said comic books have been so denigrated oh comics are garbage i vividly remember our woodworking shop teacher catching neil reading a comic book in class instead of working and he took the comic book and he tore it up in front of us and threw it in the garbage can it was a copy of howard the duck number two it would be worth bank today <laughs> if we still had it I mean, I was horrified at the time, but uh, anyway, I'm very good at digressing. So, so I'm on the subway and I open, I open this cartooning department, cannot believe this. Look at the faculty, Will Eisner, Harvey Kurtzman, Art Spiegelman, Joe Orlando. I thought I was hallucinating. I, I mean, I'd grown up on the spirit. My dad was a fan of the spirit when he was in the military in World War II. And he was not really a comics book fan, but he was a Will Eisner fan. So I, I went to school, I went to School of Visual Arts in large part because Will was teaching there. But some of the giants of, of comics. So I, sorry, I completely lost the track. How did we get onto that? School of Visual Arts? <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. What was uh, your question? So <laughs> I don't even remember. You, you tell such beautiful stories. But oh, thanks. You get lost I'm sorry. I completely so, uh, went off the I rails mean, there. Now that we're on the topic of it, though, uh, tell us about your experience working under uh, Will Eisner and also the other influencers that you have uh, been so fortunate to just work around and whatnot. Well, with great pleasure, I, I could talk all day about this. So, so I'd already I already had a year of college in Boston. I'd gone to a large school in Boston, which I, I didn't really uh, I didn't really care for. The phrase diploma factory was used to describe it. But I did then transfer to the School of Fine Arts there, and I, I really liked that. And I had a wonderful, I was kind of part-time there. I was, I didn't, I was 19. I didn't know what I want to do. I don't think people should go to college when, in their teens. I think you should take a few years off, work in the real world, figure out what you want to do. College is not for everyone. So I made a mistake. I went to a college that didn't suit me. 
and then a few years later as i i related i accidentally fortuitously discovered school of visual arts through the kindness of my friend maureen and i decided i was going to start fresh i didn't carry over any of my existing credits i i i I, I cleaned the, I cleaned off my desk of school. I'm going to have a completely fresh experience. And I was, well, I was part of the original punk rock movement. Our band, the band that Neil and I started, we were, we existed when punk started and I remained a professional musician for many years. And so being 17 and playing in a London punk band and being at this very strict school, it really wasn't working. It didn't, <laughs> I definitely was not fitting in. And so I I didn't think I didn't think school was any good. I didn't think school was for me. But the truth of the matter is I hadn't found the right school. Although I did I my well I I didn't finish English school. I I did my my equivalent to 12th grade at, at the international school, the American school in London, in St. John's Wood, which was an amazing school, which I, I loved, but I only, I only did one year there. And then I stayed in London and I played with my punk band. And then I moved to the States, moved to New York, Boston, and back to New York. So what I was not, going back to school was not in my life plan. And when I did decide to go to School of Visual Arts, I went with all my heart and Robert Persig, the, the brilliant author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, talks about this, that when you get to that place and you want to learn, you've decided that you want to learn, you want to be a good student, there's not, it's an unstoppable force. There, there's nothing that can stop you. So I was nearly 24 when I went back to school, and most of the students in my year were 17 and 18. And that makes a really big difference, those six years. So. I was a bit frustrated at first because at, at SVA, it didn't matter what your what your major was, what your plan was, you had to do foundation year. And I was so committed. No, oh, I'm going to be a cartoonist, comics, comics. I'm going to be a cartoonist. I just cannot wait to study with Will Eisner and Harvey Kurtzman and Art Spiegelman. I don't want to spend a year doing foundation year, but it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. We did we did sculpture and life drawing and oil painting, and I I studied with some fantastic artists. Farrell Brickhouse was my painting teacher. And uh, I just reconnected with him on Facebook very recently. Uh, talk about the wonders of the internet. So I, I really embraced my foundation year. And I used to do this thing. I would sneak up to where Will Eisner was teaching. So he lived in Florida and he taught a class called Comics and Sequential Art. And Will was very, Will believed in the, the, the literary, literary importance of comics or that comics could be, could be and should be regarded as a legitimate art form, something he shared with Art Spiegelman, but they, uh, in, a, in a different way. So Will had spent his life in, in comics and he would fly up from Florida twice a month to teach his class. So he taught an, an intro, uh, uh, introductory level class. And then he taught the portfolio class for the senior, the few seniors who were getting a degree in comics. And on alternate weeks, it, the class was taught by Andre LeBlanc, who did the Phantom comic strip for many years, who was a brilliant artist also and a very wonderful gent. So imagine this level of dedication. You live in Florida. He was in his 80s then, and he was so vigorous. He was an energetic, really present man. And he would fly up from Florida, teach both classes on the same day, teach intro to comics in the morning and portfolio class in the afternoon, stay overnight, go back to Florida the next day. What, what dedication in your 80s to do that? So I knew where his classroom was. And during foundation year, I used to sneak up and the door would be closed and I look through the glass and I see the back of Will Eisner. I go, good God, that is Will Eisner. I am 10 feet away from Will Eisner. Really one of the creators or godfathers of the comic book world, not just because of the spirit, but because of his, the, the, the instructional comics that he did, his, his American visuals work, and this idea of repackaging the 
the daily strips into comic book format. He he's is giant. He's a giant in comics, not just not just with his ability, but with his business sense. So that's how it started for me. But I'd peer through this glass, and sometimes I see the students and they they look up. They go, "There's a guy looking through the window." I was just in awe of the fact that he was physically there in the building. And then uh, the time came to go meet him. And you had to audition for his class. You couldn't just, you didn't automatically get into it. He only wanted serious people. So I, I had to go up to his class and knock on the door for the first time to make an appointment through se secretary or I don't remember the details, but it, the appointment was made. And it's near the end of my foundation year. And I have to go in, it's his portfolio class, which is even worse. It wouldn't be so bad if it was the entry level class, but you go at the end of the portfolio class and I walk in 23, 24 then with my portfolio and i said oh good good afternoon mr eisner i'd like to take your class and he goes oh let me see your portfolio so he opens my portfolio and all the students get up and they all come over and they all look at it they're all in, in my mind they're all like god this is awful uh, kind of uh, shaking their heads so fortunately i i got in i was accepted and the first thing i did was rush down to the street and call my dad in England from a payphone. I had to put about five dollars and change in the payphone, and I called him like, "I just met Will Eisner. I got accepted for his class." This oh. was, it was such a, it was such an amazing. I was so happy. But then it was the end of the year, and it's the winter holidays, and then the, the second school year starts, and I go for the first class, and there are about there are about twenty of us, I suppose. And Will was always very well dressed in, in uh, 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 no, a collared shirt and tie, and he was, he was a tall man and he had a very kind, uh, almost, uh, I don't know what the, I'm trying to find the right word. It was, it was more than a sunny presence. It was almost like a, like a, a kind priest. Like he had this spiritual, this depth to his personality. It's difficult to describe. It wasn't just because he was a giant in comics. He was a, he there were there was a kindness and a sincerity in his persona that came out so in the first class he says well so we're we're going to study we're going to study comics you're going to make comics we're going to do all these different things he outlines the class and he said one of the things that we do each year is we publish the gallery the sva gallery will eisner's sva gallery of comic book art and so you're going to produce art it's going to go into this book we're going to print it and you're going to sell it. And he was all about business. So he said, we're maybe 20 minutes into the first class. And he says, does anyone here have any publishing experience? So I, I put up my hand and he goes, right, you're the editor. So that's how difficult it was to get this job. Ugh. And I met this one guy that I knew a little bit in the class. His name was Florian Bakleda. And I said, and it, Will goes, pick your assistant editor, pick your team. So I went up to Flo, Florian, Flo, we called him after the class. And I said, Flo, you've got to help me with this. You should be my assistant editor. And he goes, no, no, I'm not really interested. I, I just wanted, and I really had to talk him into it. I go, come on, Flo, come on, it's going to be great. It's going to be a lot of extra work, but it's going to be great. And so we, en he agreed. And then we ended up doing it next year as well. So we learned, we learned how, well, the first one, we didn't do a very good job. We learned how to do it. We made a few mistakes. And then I asked Will if we could do it again, the second year, same team. And he said, oh, I've never done that before, but okay. And it was so much better the next year. And so he believed deeply that artists needed to be business people as well. And he, it wasn't enough that we just understand comics. We had to understand the business of comics and the business of printing. And he took us on a field trip to this giant print shop on Barrack Street down near where the World Trade Center was on in lower Manhattan on a class trip on a weekday it's a giant printing press they are printing newspaper I mean not printing press enormous concrete building the size of a city block in New York giant printing presses and he he instilled in me that if you were going to do good work if your work was going to be printed the way you wanted and have control of your work as we were talking about earlier Joe Strummer and all that artistic control. You have to understand the process. If you do something and it's not going to print well, you're the one who suffers. Your artwork suffers. And so this also was a profound eye-opening experience for me to go and stand on the floor of this enormous commercial 
union blue collar print shop and see all of these people working and all the care that they took in adjusting the machines and the noise of it, all these newspapers and magazines going through. It, 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 was, it was fantastic to, to see this. And Will also said that if you wanted to be a real cartoonist, an important cartoonist or a great cartoonist, you had to have something to say. And he, I, I think this message was lost on some of the other students, Frank, to be frank. But he said, if you grow up on comics and you only read comics and you don't do anything but reading comics and writing comics, you don't have any life experience. You don't have a story of substance or significance to tell. And so he encouraged us to read classic short stories by great authors and also to go out and experience life so that you would have something to talk about. And well, as, you've, as you said at the beginning and you've noticed from my bio, I really did that. I really wanted to, I wanted to have great experiences that would enrich my, my heart and my life and my storytelling ability. And I, I owe that to Will. I was an adventurous guy anyway, but this, I absorbed this into my bones that if you want to be a creator, if, if you want to tell meaningful stories, you have to live first. Oh yeah. That's wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. So I loved every moment of my, Will. I, I repeated the class. So I took the class, I took his class and then I got special dispensation from the Dean, David Rhodes, who was a wonderful, wonderful gent, the, the director of the Dean at the School of Visual Arts to take the class again. And I, I had to really pitch this. I had, to, I had to sell it to Will. I had to sell it to David Rhodes, probably the head of the illustration department as well. I've taken Will's class. I want to take it again. I want to really understand the process of making this magazine. And our second one was so much better. And then in the third year, I took my portfolio class with him. So I had the great privilege of working with, studying with him and working on this magazine with him for three consecutive years. And it, I often look back, this is what I, I mentioned this earlier, but it's Forrest Gump-like thing. I just happened to be in New York in the 80s when, when the School of Visual Arts had these fantastic giants in comics teaching. So partly because of Will's influence and the opportunity that I had to put this book together, I didn't know anything about graphic design or art direction at all. Uh, Flo and I learned. And Florian, my friend who didn't want to be my assistant editor, went on to be a brilliant art director in, still in New York City worked on many major magazines and has had an amazing career. And I, I, I teased him about it and I go, man, you owe me a big, a big thank you. But I, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Because we both wanted to be cartoonists, but we both ended up being art directors. Instead, we discovered that we liked or were better at putting the books together, overseeing the project, choosing the cover illustration. We were better at that than drawing the actual comics. And since we're talking about that, I brought I just I brought this to show you. This is my Will Eisner original. Wow. So he gave this to me in 1984, or I think. And this was the artwork for the first edition of the SBA gallery that we did. And he did this in front of me in I don't know, 10 minutes with Jeez. a brush. He didn't use a pen, he illustrated with a brush and a and a bottle of ink. He would dip the brush into the ink. And, and that's why his work has this beautiful painterly quality where the thickness of the line varies because it was all done with brushes. He was such an artist. He could have been a great painter if, if he wanted, I'm sure. So to sum up the answer to, to your question, it, it, was, it was a life-changing experience, both in the way it enriched my my experience of art and comics and also because it set me on this path of being an art director and and believing that you that you should live life to the fullest so that you have stories to tell and also he was really a seminal artist businessman he believed in owning your own product he believed in that all artists needed to understand commerce so that they could market their work 
and understand you know, there was he gave us a class on copyright and ownership so these these lessons that many of us learn the hard way about having control of your work and licensing it and protecting your intellectual property he was aware he was aware of this from the beginning he was he was a clever man he set up his own visual his own communications company he had the copyright ownership of, of his products and he understood licensing and he he conveyed all of this in a friendly sunny way yet with great conviction nobody was going to go oh mr eisner i don't really think what you're saying is accurate that ne that never happened it was uh oh yes and i uh, he also brought in special guests mm. so he one of the guests that we had was jules pfeiffer the the pulitzer prize winning cartoonist and he at that time was doing i believe a weekly uh, half page strip for the village voice in new york and he he was he was a giant also so will had given jules pfeiffer his first job when he was a teenager and he would always call him you go know, my boy jules and Jules Pfeiffer, a grown man, a very successful cartoonist. Can you imagine sitting in the room with Jules Pfeiffer and Will Eisner talking about comics? And so Will had taught so many students over the years that he said humorously one day that he had his students were in all these key positions in the comics industry all over the States and the world, probably. And that one day he was going to give the signal and they were just going to take over. <laughs> <laughs> In a kindly, joking way, because he, he was not that kind of person. He was a very generous, kind person. But yeah, I, I mean, I just loved being in his presence. It was, it was, it was, we say, oh, I met this person. It was inspiring. And this was, this was profoundly inspiring right. in, in your heart. And it, it, it last, that was in the 80s. So it's sure lasted all these years. That original that I showed you is on the wall in my house. I look at it, I walk by it 10 times a day. And it's, I feel that, uh, no joke intended, I feel that his spirit lives on in, in everything, all the artwork that I do. And the same with Harvey Kurtzman, mm -hmm. who was also an extraordinarily kind and wacky person. And in, it was towards the end of Harvey's teaching career that I had the privilege of studying with him. And he had, he had early stage Parkinson's mm -hmm. then. And so one of his students, the cartoonist Sarah Downs, a former student, that she was then a professional artist, came in and, and assisted with him teaching the class. He, you wouldn't know that, that he had Parkinson's. And it was, he, it was great, it showed great devotion, I think, to his students to come in and teach. And I, I once met Terry Gilliam. It was actually at Harvey's funeral that I met Terry Gilliam. So Terry, Harvey was a big inspiration, a mentor to, to Terry and to me. And, and Terry told the story about how the first time he met Harvey Kurtzman, he couldn't believe that it was actually Harvey Kurtzman. It didn't seem possible because Harvey was quite a slight man. He was slender and he had this, this beatific presence. He, he, you would think maybe he was a monk. He was, he was very gentle. You could tell that there was brilliance in, inside him, but he was, he was very quiet and thoughtful. And I'd look at him and I'd go, how did Mad Magazine and all of this, all of this crazy stuff, all of these comic strips come out of this mind that seems so calm and peaceful? And it was Harvey who recommended me to Art and Francoise. Uh, what they, they called Harvey, who was a, a hero to them as he was to all of us and, and said, we're looking for, do you, have a, do you have a particular student who's good with, with graphics and is reliable that you'd recommend because we're looking for an associate editor at Raw? And Harvey said, uh, yeah, Jeff recommended just me, Jeff Notkin. And so I called Francoise and I went in for an interview and gosh, I mean, talk about brilliant people. So she was the, was the art director for Raw Magazine. She did everything by hand. She cut the color separations by hand for the magazine. And she had such attention to detail. It, it, she was the right kind of perfectionist. And so I, I, had the, I, I went on this journey where I, I learned 
about graphics and art direction and printing and production and all of that in Will's class. And then I refined it the second year. And then I went on to edit Harvey's magazine, put together Harvey's magazine cartoons with a, with a K, K-A-R-T-U-N-Z. And then, and then Harvey recommended me to raw books and graphics. This is what I mean, like this Forrest Gump thing. I mean, it, imagine I, I was almost embarrassed. Harvey Kurtzman recommended me and said I would be good. I would be a good employee. And then I just went for this interview with Francoise, who's now the art director for, for The New Yorker, of course, and has been a just a, an extremely important force in, in, in graphic arts and publishing for decades. And I had this interview with her and I got the job. And then I went back in the next day and started working there's art. And I said, he, he looked at me and I go, I, I'm, I was your student last year. I'm the one who ran the slide projector. And he goes, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yes, oh yes, 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 I, I remember you. And that's, that's really how my career as an art director started. And you, <laughs> you couldn't ask for a better or more intense learning experience than working with Francoise and I I was her assistant I I worked with her every day for a couple of years several years on on raw and art was doing mouse at that time Up, upstairs they had a wonderful amazing building in Soho and that's when that's really when my graphics and art direction career started so I I'm so lucky so fortunate to have had these people as my mentors, mm -hmm. and I, I, I talk about this. I know, I know, we're gonna we're gonna talk about this later. But this, so this is my memoir, my incredibly strange and amazing real life adventures in the world of comic books, which oris originally was going to be a series of little books. I was I wanted to do little little mini books like this, oh. and I was going to do one each on Neil Gaiman, Will Eisner, Harvey Kurtzman, and Art Spiegelman. Mm -hmm. the, these four great figures in, in my life in, in comics and then I go well I should, then I should also write a bit about raw books and graphics and then I should write a bit about how I got into it and how I how I love Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby as a kid and it just it evolved it evolved into this book into that book oh wow and the way this happened was a, a, a friend of mine took me to see the documentary Dear Mr. Watterson mm -hmm. about the creator of Calvin and Hobbes at the loft here in Tucson and it was another that was in probably 2014 or 15. And I was very involved with television and film then. We had, it was just uh, Meteorite Men was still airing my adventure television show. And I was, I was, I was doing STEM journals, hosting STEM journals, and I was executive producer on STEM journals, an educational multi dimension, uh, multidisciplinary science show for, for middle school kids. I was very deeply involved in all of this, working on media and filming all the time. And I saw this film, and my friend Lucas Turnbloom is in it. And it was another one of those profound moments that just it reset something. For me, I, I came out of that film and I was speechless. It was so great. And I, I was so impressed by Watterson's refusal to merchandise Calvin and Hobbes. Have you seen that film? I have do, not, do you know what no. I, it's fantastic I, I i recommend it for any artist it's on streaming now I, I i don't remember which streaming service but i've seen it uh on one of the major ones it's easy to find it's a documentary about a cartoonist and he's not even in it there's mm -hmm. no interview with him and he oh. to me he's the he's the jd salinger of comics mm -hmm. he's a very he lives a very private life he doesn't he doesn't want fame want, hasn't donated all his originals to a library and resisted monumental pressure to license his characters he didn't want calvin and hobbes t-shirts and mugs and kitchen towels and whatever <laughs> plushies he didn't want it he wanted the artwork to speak for himself and for itself and he turned away millions of dollars in licensing money and the the film is in large part about that and they talk with his agent, people who knew him, and it, it takes a special kind of person to resist that. I don't think I could. Wow. I, I, I'm pretty sure I would sell out if I had a <laughs> comic strip and people wanted to license it. I'd probably try and manage it somewhat. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't want bumper stickers or what would I not want? I'd be fine with bumper stickers. I can't think of a thing that I wouldn't want, but there, I wouldn't want, there's some big companies I don't like, some big, big tech companies. I wouldn't want them using my 
character on their website. But I was so, so deeply moved by this film. I walked out of the loft and I was standing there in the street and I go, I've lost my connection to the world of comics. I'm not, I'm not in, I don't feel like I'm part of the world of comics anymore. And I, I went home and I started working on this book. And I've, I've written several books and this is my favorite of anything I've ever done in my life. My heart is in this book. And it starts when I was a little boy with the first comic book that I read by accident and follows it all the way through. And then my show, Meteorite Men, had a very comic book vibe in it. And then Lucas Turnbloom, I met on Twitter and he was a fan of Meteorite Men. And he asked if, if he could put us, our real selves, Steve Arnold and me, into his comic strip into his daily imagine this comic strip so my life came full circle from being so enamored of comics as a kid and wanting to be a cartoonist to going to sba and studying with these greats and then working at raw books and graphics and then i went on a different path and got into film and tv but then it came back in this cosmic recircling of things that my my television show then went into a comic book and so i know that we uh, it's probably a good time to talk about this so so Definitely. this so the first edition of this book that i love is was sold out and so james you very kindly asked if if bookmans could acquire some copies to sell and we've done a special reprint just for bookmans and bookmans will be the sole place that you can buy this during the month of march and uh, Will Eisner week and we're also going to do a giveaway so I'm going to donate five signed copies to Bookman's and you can read there's going to be a contest how you can win those and we if you could you'll be able to find out the details attached to, to this video when you when you watch it and I, I should say that the, the so my incredibly strange and amazing real life adventures in the world of comic books and the subtitle is Close Encounters with Gaiman, Eisner, Kniff, Kurtzman, Gillian, Spiegelman, and Turnbloom. And Lucas Turnbloom, my great friend, wrote the introduction and did a very amusing caricature of me as bass player, artist, meteorite hunter, some kind of scary hybrid of- Oh, that is wonderful. And also, people. I hear that you are on a Garbage Pail Kids card as well. Oh dear, yes. <laughs> well, now, okay, so I, I will tell this story as it relates to, to Beth Carrillo, who is the president of Aerolite Meteorites, which is my science company. I'm a, a meteorite specialist too, as you know, and, we have a we have an international company that's based here in Tucson called called Aerolite, and I've been all over the world searching for meteorites, and we that's what the television show Meteorite Men was about, which ran for three seasons on Science Channel, and we make meteorite specimens available to anyone who's interested to to collectors, to museums, to universities all around the world. And when I was a kid, at, at the same time, I became I fell in love with comics. I also fell in love with meteorites. And so they've also been present in my life. And this, this idea that you could own something from outer space, you could own it, you could touch it, you could hold it in your hand, was astonishing to me. And so Aerolite, I've been, I've been working with meteorites for over 25 years. So Aerolite is, uh, we, have, we, have an, we have an online presence. We do the Tucson Gem Show. And so my, the president of the company, Beth Curio, she's worked with me for about 12 years. She's a, she's a very impressive woman. She is a, a, a fantastic, a capable businesswoman. She's very devoted to the company. And when this book came out, she read it. And then she came into my office one day and I met, she had an expression on her face that I'd never seen before. She's, uh, she has a very commanding presence. She's a great executive. So she came in and she had this puzzled, shocked expression on her face. And I said, are you okay? And she goes, I've just finished reading your book. You're a garbage pill kid. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes. And she was blown away by this. And I go, Beth, you've been 
working with me, you've been on television, you've worked on indie feature films, you've gone to events all over the world, we went to New York City, you've met astronauts, you've met famous scientists, all these things that have happened. And the thing that finally impresses you is that I'm a garbage pill kid. And she goes, yes, that I grew up, she goes, I grew up on garbage pill kids. I was obsessed with garbage pill kids. So, so the car Def Jeff, G-E-O-F-F, -F. so here's the story. Art Spiegelman invented Garbage Pail Kids, and he also invented Wacky Packs, the uh, the ad parody bubblegum cards. And he, uh, if I remember correctly, when he was in his teens, Topps Bubblegum Company in New Jersey gave him a job. I think it was his first, maybe his first job in media art design. And he was very loyal to them. And he, in the years when he was teaching and I was I was working with him and Francoise, he would go one day a week to Topps and they would work on projects. And so Garbage Pail Kids were, were a huge hit in the 80s. So at, at Raw Books and Graphics, I had this enormous glass light table that I worked on. We were still doing cut and paste up mechanicals by hand. This was, this was the mid to late 80s. It was the pre-desktop era. We were still doing everything by hand. And there were always mountains of stuff on my, on my table, things I'm working on from Francoise, layouts for the magazine, ads, whatever, incoming artwork we had to look at. So I go into work one day and the entire table has been cleared off. There's nothing on it at all. I look at the table and I go, oh, what happened? The table must have broken. Maybe they're repairing it. They've taken everything off. And I walk up to the table and there's this bubblegum card just lying on the middle of the table and nothing else. And it's the Def Jeff card. And so in the 80s, I wore a always wearing a biker jacket and sunglasses. And if you're not familiar with the card, he's holding a boom box on his shoulder and is blowing his brains out the side and there's nuts and bolts and all these things coming out of his coming out of his head. So yeah, there it is. My claim to fame. <laughs> Def Jeff. And Marty, your Marty Catola, your <laughs> colleague, my friend, my fellow producer on our films Revenge of Zoe and the Love Song of William H. Shaw, forthcoming, which is in production. Marty somehow manages to find a Def Jeff card for me every year for Christmas, an original. And it's the best gift I could have every year. He brings me a Def Jeff card for our, at our Christmas lunch. And so I have a little stack of them, which I, I treasure. Oh, that's so wonderful. It's, on my, it's in the trivia on my IMDb page, actually. Oh, uh, is it? <laughs> that story. Yes. So yes, Art and Francoise had a great sense of humor, and I loved the way they, they, they did that. And in in at that time, I would go to the. This was of course pre eBay and pre internet. You couldn't just get on eBay and find what you want. So I would go and I'd buy stacks of cards, loads of them, and go through them and pull out the Def Jeffs. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I probably tossed the rest, although they were very good. I don't know why I did that. I I don't know. I don't. I probably. I'm sure they're around the house somewhere, the other ones, but I would give them, I would, before Marty gave me, I would give them to friends as a oh. gift. And, and so sometimes I'll get an email or a Facebook post from someone that go, oh, I was, I was going through my scrapbook and I found the Def Jeff card that you gave me. <laughs> it is. So yeah, it's easy to find online. You can do it just, but it's G-E-O-F-F. -F. G-E-O-F-F. -F. So you know, it's me. The yeah. fancy spelling. <laughs> yeah, and I was right. I was playing in a New York rock band at the time, a loud rock band called The Big Picture. So it was definitely legit. It was yeah, relevant. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. And I did have a big boombox also. Uh, it was the 80s, you know. Well, didn't I, everybody I have one of those back it. then? I hope so. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. The yeah. 80s in New York City were very colorful. I feel oh. very lucky to have been there. New York was still pretty gritty and and uh, and somewhat dangerous and, and immensely exciting. Very cool. So, uh, Jeffrey, tell us a little bit about um, your time uh, walking through a bookman's store. Uh, what sections do you frequent most? Oh, I love that. So, I live in the Northwest. My local is is the Bookman's on Ina on Ina Road, and I I must have been there hundreds of times. And I, your store as well, Bookman's East as well, I love. I mean, I know that Bookman's East is the mothership, but it's, it's quite far from me. It's the best store in Tucson. I'm not biased I, I, at all. I, I think it's the best store in the country, if, <laughs> if you ask me. I, I, when we were emailing, 
I said, I told you I was going to do this. I'm an immense fan of Bookman's. I'm not saying this because I'm doing an interview interview with you. I, I, as I said earlier, I'm, 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 I'm all to, I think to you privately before we started the interview, I am all about local, about buy local. I support local businesses, the, the, the vendors that we use whenever possible for Aerolite and my production company, we use local vendors. It's really important not just because it supports the economy of, of our city, but because it supports people who are trying to do similar things to, to what we're doing. So I'm very anti big online chains of retailers that are, whether it's in, intentionally or just by accident, the way the world goes, making it very difficult for independent retailers to compete. So I choose to spend my dollars at Shops like Bookman's and Antigone are our wonderful indie new bookstore on Fourth Avenue. I mean, it's out, not new, they've been here for many years, but that sells current releases, whereas Bookman's is more more focused on on secondhand and, and rare books and music and guitars and amps. Where else could you go? You could you could walk into Bookman's, you could buy a vintage synthesizer, guitar amp, a box set of your favorite British comedy show on dvd and then and some comics and literature so to answer your question i am uh i am a nut for i'm a i'm a, I'm a literary nut mm. so i gravitate towards the literature section and i i nearly always find i not nearly i always find something new and interesting so literature would be my number one stop i i have to i i love to go to the sci-fi section and see if there's any vintage any any old ace doubles or I I love to see Neil's books Neil Gaiman's books it just it, it just gives me a kick it never gets old I go oh there's an edition of Neil Stardust I haven't seen and <laughs> I, I have I I just I look at it and I go this is my childhood friend his books are everywhere it's the greatest the kid who was told he would never amount to anything his books are everywhere he's he's positively influenced the lives of I would imagine millions of people oh, yes. around the oh, world yeah. it's such a gift to, to be able to do that. And then I'll wind up in the magazine. Well, I always go look at the keyboards, guitars. I mean, I can't, I don't need any more guitars, but I can't not look. And, but well, I love to go look at the magazines because I'm still an art director and I'm, I'm the design consultant for Ad Astra, which is the beautiful, beautiful science magazine that's published quarterly by the National Space Society, the, of which I'm president. It's a, a global organization that promote space flight as I mentioned at the beginning so the the editor of Ad Astra Rod Pyle is a, a very good friend of mine and a, a brilliant managing editor and so I consult with the the design of the magazine and I am passionate about graphic design mm -hmm. it's it's the it's the together with I suppose perhaps photography the art form that most absorbed me that I feel most connected to so I love to look through the magazines what are the cover designs like? I, I love to look through old issues of Wired and other other magazines that you have just to keep up what's going on in design, what's good, what's great. You can see, if you look at my wall behind, my wall is covered in 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 things mm -hmm. that I like, current bits of design. That's a poster by Molly Kiley, a wonderful, brilliant cartoonist who lives here, who, who has worked for Fantagraphics and... Uh, very celebrated and wonderful cartoonist who's worked on our films with us. So another thing I love is the or the uh, staff recommendations. Oh. So so this book, I actually got this at Bookman's. This is I'm reading this at the moment. I love this book so much I'm parceling it out. This is oh. Light the Dark, Writers on Creativity, Inspiration and the Artistic Process, edited by Joe Fassler, based on his column for The Atlantic. And I saw this in your staff picks section mm -hmm. with a little note and I read the note and I opened it up and I opened it to the Jonathan Lethem interview which is called letting the leopards in where he talks about Kafka how Kafka influenced him and I discovered that like Neil and me Jonathan Lethem started reading Philip Dick at about age 11 which explains a lot in our lives really but this is such a wonderful book so this is on my on my reading table at the moment and that essay, Letting the Leopards In by Jonathan Lethem, I just think it's the single best thing I've ever read. I've read it six times now, the essay. So, yeah, 
to answer your question properly, I started literature. No, I walk in, I look at the guitars. I just look at them because I can't not look at them. And then I go and I'll sit, I'll be in the literature section and the design section. And in my store, the design section, the art and design section is kind of in a little square. It's almost oh. like a front little room and there's a little table and chair there. And I just love, I go there. I'll just go and I'll hang out and I'll look at books and I will take, probably take my headphones and maybe listen to some Brian Eno or some ambient or maybe some classical. And, but I always buy something. I really think it's important. It's important. I learned this lesson from, from my friend Tana Kelk, who used to, to run a local arts uh, store on Broadway called Bohemia. It was a wonderful, wonderful, brilliant store that only featured Tucson artists. Mm. And I knew half the people whose work was in there. And she said so many people come into the shop and they would just, they would, they'd, they'd hang out. They'd go, mm. She did a lot of events like you do at Bookman's. Mm -hmm. They did fashion shows and they did readings and, and, and openings and provide wine and food and people would come and they would she wasn't complaining she was making an observation that people don't realize they come to the thing and they have some wine and they have some cheese and they listen to the music and they go home and she said i think it's important that if you go to a thing an event you buy something even if it's a postcard just to show support and then at the end of the day the organizers can go oh we had 15 people buy something so i i never i don't think i've ever walked out of bookman's empty handed i mean you can yeah, <laughs> and you you you'll remember this. So I must compliment you that on this. This was, I guess, it was just probably a little bit before the pandemic. I was at your store, and there was a fantastic display of Raw magazine, hmm. uh, original copies of Raw, and a lot of beautiful vintage comics in uh, near the cash register. A big display. I don't know if you put that together, but I was looking at. It, I go, oh, I worked on that issue, and oh, there's this, and there's Gary Panther's book. And, Things no I had way. been involved with in the 80s. Oh, yeah, yeah, at your That's store. That's very cool. I, our, those... uh, we have a whole visual merchandiser who you know takes care of all that. So I will, oh, okay. I will relay that message for sure. Please That's do. Awesome. Please, please send my compliments to your to your your store designer. That was that. I actually went back a second time <laughs> to look at it again. It was so it was so good. I felt like, oh, I'm back in the comics world. Look at this is my era. All of this. Charles Burns and Gary Panter and Osuko and all those great artists who were published by Raw. Very cool. All righty, Jeffrey. So uh, we've brushed over this just a little bit here and there, but um, you have held um, seats and you hold seats now in um, some various scientific communities. Uh, number one, I'd very much love to hear more about them and uh, your impact on those communities and what you do. Uh, and then also, I was curious, um, in these roles, have they made an impact on the way you view comics or, um, you know, art or, um, you know, anything in, with your imagination? What a, what a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm one of those misfits who's always been a science and arts guy. Mm -hmm. And from early childhood, age six or seven, I was very smitten with with science, with mm -hmm. everything to do with science. So to put it in, in context, I was eight years old when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Mm -hmm. And I watched avidly every bit of every space program. And I was born in 1961, just a few weeks before Yuri Gagarin became the first human to go into space. So I'm the same, I'm exactly the same age as human space flight. <laughs> and I have been extremely involved in, in, a, in, a, in an amateur capacity. I'm, I mean, I'm not an engineer or an astronaut, obviously. Although like probably every kid my age, I wanted to be an astronaut <laughs> until I discovered how much hard work was involved in mathematics and learning to fly and being extra fit and, and, and all those things. So I, so I didn't get, I'm very lucky again, I didn't get to be an astronaut, but I get to hang out with astronauts all the time. <laughs> so I, yes, I am, I am president of the National Space Society, which is the world's uh, preeminent citizen's voice in, in space flight. And our organization goes back to 1974, it was originally founded by Werner von Braun, the great rocket scientist who built the Apollo rockets and then merged with O'Neill's L5 Society to form the NSS, National Space Society. And I was, I, I, I became involved in a, in a uh, professional capacity promoting spaceflight, advocating spaceflight, 
because of deep deep space industries because of rick tumlinson the the space advocate who was was instrumental in founding the asteroid mining company and asked me to come on board as an advisor because of my work with meteorites mm -hmm. so meteorites come from asteroids and if we understand meteorites we we begin to understand asteroids and so if you're going to mine rare materials from asteroids you want to pick the right ones and so that was that was how i i began to engage in the space flight world is being more than a, than a fan than an avid fan and i well i've written about space flight as well in various columns and i'm on the board of the astrosociology research institute which was founded by dr jim pass and this is an organization that looks at the ramifications of of long duration space flight and space settlement where we're, if we're gonna put people in rockets and send them far away for long periods of time, and then they're gonna live in confined environments on the moon or Mars or the asteroids, what, what does that mean in a social context? How, how, do we, how do we interact with each other socially? What are, what are the consequences of that? And how do we prepare for that? And it's, it's a new discipline. It's, it's, it's very interesting and very, and very important and something that hadn't been addressed particularly widely. So the school that I went to, the strict British school that I went to, I, I mentioned, they were quite big on science, but oh my gosh, it was so dull. It, it was as if science had gone back in time in these giant dusty classrooms with these leaded light windows and these antique microscopes and Bunsen burners. And it, it felt like, one of these i don't know it felt like sherlock holmes <laughs> yeah, right we're going to we're going to melt this potassium derivative in this beaker with the when you think about the things we did it would never be allowed today working with hydrochloric acid and burners and melting stuff and we didn't wear we didn't have safety goggles mm. then it, i guess when we were working with acid maybe but gosh this the the safety the the uh, the uproar about safety of students that such a thing would cause today would really be something but the the school didn't satisfy my hunger for science there was no geology or paleontology or astronomy it was physics chemistry and biology we did have one terrific science teacher but mostly it was it was it was very dull so i looked elsewhere i went to the museums i read books my my parents were a bit worried about me as a kid because my bedtime reading was things like the field guide to prospecting and and uh, searching for uh, uranium and other radioactive minerals. And this is, I mean, what kind of a nut would read those books as a kid? That and comics. And, and my, my mother was always trying to get me to read novels. She would give me, she would give me children's literature. And I, I just, I, I wasn't interested. It was comics and science. Uh, that was it. So I guess that's where it started. And I was always out in the, I grew up in, in, in Southern, in greater London, the Southern edge of London in surrey in the county of surrey which is rolling chalk hills so i was always out in the quarries looking for fossils and i think my my serious entry into the science world was as an artist mm. i started working for doing some freelance work for people in the meteorite and fossil world doing photographing specimens i i looked i looked at these these businesses these these scientific areas that i loved the, the commercial side of paleontology and the commercial side of meteorites and it was very poor it was it, it was very badly presented <laughs> and no disrespect i mean i love my colleagues deeply in this field but they're they're rock heads they're, they they their expertise is going out and finding fossils and meteorites and, and all of this and and presenting that work in a in an interesting exciting and professional graphic way is not their forte and why should it be and i so i saw an opportunity there and i started doing design for museums museum catalogs building websites for mm -hmm. for people in the science world and that's how i re-engaged with science strangely enough was through art and as i met people and did more photography and spent time with specimens i I started going back out into the field again and started searching for meteorites and, and reignited my love of paleontology and, and fossils. So, so science got, so the art, art world got me back into science after being very disenchanted with it in school because it was so stagnant. It was 
the laws of motion and thermodynamics, but there was no excitement in this. Science is exciting. We, we begin to understand how the universe works. And it was taught in such a dull, repetitive way at school that I couldn't engage with it at all. And today, I'm, I'm, I'm still an art director. I mentioned that I'm design consultant for Ad Astra, for the, for, the, for the magazine, for the National Space Society. And so I'm still doing that in a, in a sense. I'm still looking at the science world and, and asking myself, how do we communicate the, the message in a more exciting and relevant way? And that is a that is a that's a big part of, of my work. I love, as I said earlier, I love graphic design. I love art direction and photography. This is these are the these are the parts of the art world where I fit best. Right. I've I've tried oil painting. I I I as you know <laughs> tried comics. I'm a, I could describe myself as a recovering cartoonist. <laughs> I I discovered that. I work very slowly compared to say Jack Kirby. Well, I think anyone probably works slowly compared to Jack Kirby. But if if you want to be a successful cartoonist, you have to produce work on a regular basis. And for me to do a one page comic strip, because I'm very detail oriented and there's all kind of references to things and everything. It takes me about three days to do okay. one page. <laughs> And I can't remember how many pages per day Kirby was doing, but I think it was, I don't know, six or eight pages a day or something he was penciling. One of, one of your viewers will know, a Jack, Kirby, <laughs> a, a Jack Kirby fan will. If you know the answer to that question, please post in the comments. How many pages did Jack Kirby draw in a day at the height of his career? So I, and I talk about that in the book, in the comics book, in the memoir, that I realized at a certain point in my life that I, in fact, was not going to be a cartoonist for my, the rest of my life. But I, but it's okay. I found something that I'm better at, which is art direction. And so I get to work with cartoonists. And the, so the poster behind me, Revenge of Zoe, I, I know you're familiar with that. That's the feature film that we shot in Tucson a couple of years ago. Marty Cotola, your friend and colleague, is, is half of the writing, editing, uh, writing directing team, sorry, with Cliff Campbell, who's a, a brilliant director, who used to live in Tucson and now lives in Oklahoma City. And this, is an indie feature film that's set in the world of comic books. It was filmed in Tucson with the Tucson crew and the Tucson cast in, in part at Isle of Games where, with the kind assistance of our friend Drew Callan and in large part at Charlie's Comics on Cole on the east side. And Charlie, the owner of the comic book shop, has just been a saint allowing us to film there and <laughs> interrupt his, <laughs> his daily work. So I, in addition to being one of the four producers of this film, I'm the art director. And the story, actually, the only reason that I am a producer of this film is because of the comics book, is, be, is because of this little book. So, so my friend Eric Schumacher, who is a, a hugely talented actor, director, producer, and I know he's being featured in your local creators series. You're, you're going to have a great time talking to him. He, he's a, a fascinating gent and, and, and one of my best friends. So... He was working on this film. They were, they, Marty Cotola and Cliff Campbell had written this script about this film that's set in the comic book world. And Eric it was one of the stars of the film. So he called me and he said, Jeff, would you consider doing a cameo in this film? And they come up with the idea that I go into the comic book shop and I buy a copy of my own book. We like doing meta things, it, it amuses us. So I said, sure, uh, why not? That'd be fun. So I was invited to the table read at Charlie's, at Charlie's Comics. We had a full cast table read. I hadn't read the script yet. I just read my bit. I just read my page. I told him I'd read the script, but I hadn't. <laughs> so I go to the table read and for the entire, I cannot wait for the table read to be over because the script is so good. It's just I'm dying to ask if I can be more involved with this film. So the minute the table read is over, I run outside and I grab Eric and I go, come here, I've got to ask you something. What? I, I, I'm definitely going to do the cameo, but I love this script so much. Would you ask the guys if they might consider taking me on as a producer? Okay. Are you sure you have time for this? He goes, <laughs> We've got a very modest budget. I, go, I don't mind. I don't need to be paid. I just want to be part of it. So good. The script is so good. So, so they agree. And then the first day, Marty told me this later, the first day of filming, we're at, we're at 
at Charlie's, and this was maybe two weeks out from, or, or if that, starting filming. It was very close to starting filming. So I go, okay, I'm going to get involved. I'll do location photography. I'll help with production costs, whatever you need with, with media, with this, and this and that. So we came up with the idea of peppering the movie with comic book, with cameos by comic book creators. So I reached out to Rhea Golden, who lives in Santa Fe. She works with George R.R. Martin to wow. do some original art for us. And I reached out to Lucas Turnblum, who I, I mentioned before. And I flew, Lucas is such a good sport. I flew him here from San Diego. He stayed at my house overnight so that he could do a cameo in the film. <laughs> there is also a cameo by Tim Zahn, the, the famous Star Trek writer and creator of, of Admiral Thrawn. And the, that, was, that was the plan. We would... Sorry, I'm I just, lost uh, your lost video. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, sorry, lost you there for a moment. So, th so this was the idea. We would, we would pepper the movie we, with as many comic book cameos as we could. David Lee Summers, the local science fiction writer, is in it, and it was an absolute blast. And Lucas was so good. It, it's a small part, but it's so funny. He's so natural, and was such a good sport to come out and do this. Right. And then, I, I can't wait to see this. It, this is all for Revenge of Zoe, correct? Yes, correct. Yes. yes. I cannot Which... wait to see this. It's going to be streaming <laughs> relatively soon, I believe. Uh, uh, very so... soon. So could be any day. So right. we have signed. We signed a distribution deal with Brink Vision with mm -hmm. David Pike, who I, I mentioned earlier, did the Dream Dangerously film uh, for us. Did a wonderful job on that on the hard media release. So David's the distributor, and it's expected to release on Prime any day now. And the one of the reasons I was so drawn to this film is it's so true to the comic book world, and it's huh. written with a with a real love of fandom. I mean, we're nerds. We're comic book nerds. We are we are part of fandom. We are we are enmeshed enmeshed in the fandom world, and we're proud of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the soul of this film, is this this strange but relentless love we have of the comic comic book world. I mean, it's not for everyone. It's a weird world, and it's full of eccentric and colorful people whom we <laughs> adore. And we got as many of them as we could into this film. And the sequel to Revenge of Zoe is already well on the way. We filmed most of it. We were filming it when the pandemic really hit. We shut down on, I don't know, towards the end of March. We were three days shy of finishing the film, shooting here in Tucson at multiple locations. And we just thought it was too risky mm -hmm. to continue. So we're, we're gonna get back to that whenever we can. But we took the idea of creating this comic book world way further in the <laughs> song of William H. Shaw, way further. So the, the uh, oh, I'll backtrack for a minute. So the first day of filming, we're at Charlie's and we're getting ready to shoot. And there is this big poster on the wall of a frenzy of the comic book that is the center of the story. This is about this superhero named Frenzy. And she's a, she's a vigilante. She's a tough, feisty vigilante who's played by Rachel Netherton brilliantly in the films, a local, local actor. So I see this big poster on the wall, which they've, they've done, they've printed themselves. And there was a white border around it, hadn't been cut neatly. It, didn't, it just looked like it was paper that had been stuck on the wall. So I said to Marty, hey, do you mind if I, if I fix that? And I, she goes, sure. And I took it down and I had my art director's box with my exacto knife and all my stuff in it. So I cut it up and tidied it up and fixed the seam and put it back on. And much later, Marty said to me, he didn't, we didn't know each other that well. Then. We'd met but hung out a few times. But he said to me, when I saw you do that, I knew everything was going to be okay. <laughs> it was one of the nicest things anyone ever said to me. So said to me, so I, I mean, I'd always dreamed of being an art director in a film. And I really, I really went at it with gusto. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna move this a little bit. So you see that 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 thing behind me? It's it's yes. a poster for that. So that's metal metal robots of the underground, <laughs> and that is a that is a comic book series that doesn't exist. I completely invented that for <laughs> for the film for the Love Song of William H. Shaw, and that you'll see that in the film along with loads of other things that we invented: sci-fi books, 
magazines, covers. There are all sorts of references to to things that we love and the comic book world. Actually, there's another there's another thing up there. That that picture up there. It's weird to point backwards. That's Rachel Netherton who plays Frenzy in the films, and that is a fake book cover that I designed, but comic book diaries. But uh, yeah, comic book diaries by one of the. It's written by nate campbell's character in the film so it's filled with self-referential stuff and we're all big philip dick fans big massive huge philip dick fans philip dick is my favorite writer of all time there are so many philip dick references in this film in love song in the sequel not in zoe any philip dick fan is gonna be hugely entertained by <laughs> by this so so we love this idea of creating a a fictitious yet believable fandom world mm -hmm. where these comic books really exist right so yes that is the story of of zoe and and william shaw and i i mentioned also i i decided oh this was um this was another another bookman's find was rebel without a crew mm -hmm. rodriguez book memoir of of shooting el mariachi that i found in the film section no that was also a staff pick at Bookman's. Hmm. Oh, what, what, a, what a read. Oh my gosh. So I, I, I read it and I emailed Marty and I go, you got to read this book. And he goes, oh, I've read it five times. It's one of my favorite books. So it's all about how Robert Rodriguez made El Mariachi really with no money. And it's such an uplifting, inspiring story. And he, he kept the diary while he was shooting it. So I decided to do that for, for Love Song. And I started it on New Year's Eve, 2019, 2020. The first bit is about how it's New Year's Eve and I'm home happily working on the logo for Love Song of William H. Shaw on New Year's Eve. There's gotta be something wrong with you. A, if you're doing that and B, if you're happy with the situation that you're doing that instead of being at a New Year's party. So I thought, well, I'm gonna keep this journal like Rodriguez did for Rebel Without a Crew. And it'll be a funny, it'll be a little book. We'll self-publish it with a, my, my press thing. Eight press will publish it one day. Mm -hmm. Little imagining that it was going to end up being a diary about how COVID shut down production and all the problems that we've had. And I'm at 110,000 words and we haven't finished the film yet. Wow. <laughs> so so I, I was very lucky. And I mean, it's a horrible situation, of course. Half a million people have died, but... But I started this book just as a fun little story about how we made a, a, a modest budget indie feature film. And mm -hmm. it's ended up being, a, you could almost call it like the Journal of the Plague Years. <laughs> yeah. So instead of talking about the film, I'm talking about how we're all in quarantine. I haven't seen my friends, how difficult it was to get our cast home. Mm -hmm. Cliff had to drive home to Oklahoma City. He didn't want to get on a plane, understandably. So I, I've, I've chronicled how this terrible pandemic has affected us as artists and how our film was shut down and how we managed to to keep it alive and sure. we finally, we've only got three days filming left if we'd been able to do those three days the film would be edited and out by now but Gosh. but uh art oh. is uh you're uh, cutting out there again my friend uh, there it goes i'm so sorry somebody Somebody had the bad taste to call me while I was. I had to <laughs> not disturb on, but it's call still popped up. So yes, so we we've we've stuck together and, and we've soldiered through and and in fact the title of that book when, when it's finished is not intended for mainstream consumption. <laughs> that Joe Strummer quote and the subtitle is a filmmaker's apocalypse journal. Huh. And we actually went out and filmed in Tucson one day. Uh, right after the shutdown and we went down to u of a and fourth avenue and we wandered around so, some of the beautiful buildings and structures that we have in tucson and it was really like being in one of those 70s post-apocalyptic films wow. there wasn't a soul on the street and we took rachel netherton in full costume with a big blaster rifle and a backpack and she wandered through all these abandoned spaces and we're going to use that in the film it's going to be a film within a film because we we just keep doing of that you, you we cannot get to. too meta you do have to all right my very last question for you is uh where can our viewers uh follow along with your uh journey 
uh, oh, artistically wonderful. and just, you know, all of your social media presences, your website and, you know. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for asking. So I'm very active on social media on particularly Twitter, also Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and I'm at Jeff Notkin, G-E-O-F-F-N-O-T-K-I-N. Mm -hmm. on 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 all those and i i do my own social media i'm i like i really like to connect with people who enjoy my work and to uh, to share ideas and support other artists and i i love sharing work from people i meet and like and admire we're we're a community we have to support each other that's that's how that's how we get somewhere making connections and talking to each other about our work Absolutely. and then my meet my meteorite company is is airlight meteorites and that's Aerolite, A E R O L I T E dot org. And we are, we are a, a prominent organization in this field. We, in a, we don't just buy and sell meteorites. We travel, we search for meteorites, we do education, we do outreach, short films, publish books. The Aerolite works with my publishing company on the meteorite books. We have, uh, we did a, a 75 minute documentary film about how to identify meteorites because. We get, we get thousands of inquiries every year from around the world from people who think they found meteorites. And so we made a film that was shot here in Tucson and in the Sahara, mm. and that's on our, on our Vimeo, uh, the Aerolite Meteorites Vimeo wow. channel. So that, that was, a, was a pretty ambitious project. But, uh, and I, I have my own website, jeffnotkin.com, and also notkin.net. I, I, I got into the web too early. I've just, there's so many things out there. <laughs> and and Desert Owl Productions is the production company, and we have, we have a Facebook page and a Twitter account. So that's our that's our Tucson based production company that worked on STEM journals and many many short film projects, and and uh, hopefully more adventure shows to come. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, Jeff. It has been an absolute pleasure pleasure getting to know yeah. you uh, today. Uh, your insight into the comic book industry and just you know being a creator and surviving <laughs> is absolutely incredible. Uh, we're super excited to uh, have your books in our store. I mean, it's it's a privilege to uh, be able to support you uh, in that way. And thank you so much for supporting us. Oh, thank you, James. It's uh, really been an extraordinary pleasure speaking with you. You have such good questions and, and uh, it really has been a fun, lively conversation. And I, I look forward to continuing my marvelous relationship with Bookman's. You are, you're a great asset to Tucson, to, to readers and students and teachers and, and musicians and people who just love media. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, a really important part of, of our community. And I, I, I put you up there with, with the Loft Cinema, it's another organization that I love that does so much for, for the arts here Absolutely. in Tucson and, and literacy and learning and fun. So <laughs> it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the time. And uh, I, I'm so grateful to be part of Will Eisner Week, remembering uh, my mentor and, and the great influence he had on the arts. <laughs>